Trade Limitless on HMX, the next-gen decentralized perpetual exchange. Trade crypto FX commodities with up to 1,000x leverage on the Arbitrum network. Benefit from low fees, multi-asset collateral support, and cross-margin flexibility. Check them out. From meme to utility, Floki has it all. NFT metaverse game called Valhalla. Floki University, DeFi, charity, and shopping. Floki is governed by the people, for the people. Floki, together, there is no stopping us. This has been a sponsored content highlighting our partners, and I'm your host for today's last session, or one of the last session at Free Trading Congress, the fifth edition of Free Trading Congress, Adrian Zunchik, CMT Charter Market Technician, CryptoBurp, and I'm joined today by the excellent expert in the field, Mike Maglone, who's a senior commodity strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence, and that person who I always look up to with so much market insight. How's it going, Mike? It's good, Adrian. Thanks for having me, and I appreciate that big bump to start i'll do my best to live up to it <laughs> you're gonna crush it like you always do the need to live mm -hmm. up to it you are just a pure pure intelligence and inspirous form and uh well how's it been lady for you that's been a wild ride in 2023 hasn't it yes well um i try to act like i know stuff i'm doing my best to do that it's basically what i do for a living is write stuff act like i know but, but coming on your program is the fun part when I act, act like to talk about stuff I write about. So to me, the key thing I remember about this year in terms of cryptos and certain of all assets is everything that went down last year is up this year. And that is shows positive correlations to markets expectations that the U.S. will not enter a recession is kind of the macro. The things that are really down are commodities, like crude oil's down almost 10%. Um, industrial metals are down about 10%, and gold's up about 10%. So the way I look at this narrative right now is the risks are that we do head towards a pretty significant recession that I think is worthy of the most significant rate hikes on a global basis ever and the biggest pump in liquidity ever that's dumped at the fastest pace ever. And it's just starting to show early days for that. Now, the key thing to remember is, yes, people like me were early and were wrong, but we have another 100 basis points of hikes this year <laughs> because of that. And a Fed that's still, okay, looks like all the central banks in the world are done tightening. But so I think we're right now at the end of the beginning of the Great Reset. The reset started with the biggest pump in liquidity, and then we've had the biggest dump, and now we should tilt over towards recession. The key question is what stops that normal trajectory, and I think it's just a delayed thing at the moment because of the extremities of what we did and the his historic aspects of what we did in the last two or three years in our global economies. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean. I couldn't agree more. We just actually wrapped this the session in a right right beforehand with Tavi Costa, oh, Tavi Costa, excellent, also macro yeah. macro Tavi's strategist good. and um, yeah, Tavi's Tavi's awesome, you know. And we just spent you know quite a portion of time talking about well the recessive environment, the stagflationary environment, you know, still uh, yield curve inversion and so on. So, is there any actual um, downfall for the economy that you are that yeah. you're trying to sense in there. So I, I will stick with. Um, let me repeat what I heard Roger ba Roger Babson said in September 1929 to an audience in in Massachusetts. Um, he actually started Babson College, and he was counter to Irving Fisher. He was very bearish in stock market. He says, I will repeat to you what I said to you about this time last year and the year before. Not so much last year, but I think what's happening now is just getting started. And that's severe deflationary recession. And severe deflation is showing up in many places. So first of all, the downward trajectories in PPI and CPI in this country in a 12-month annual basis are just a 12-month the average basis are about as extreme as the most extreme pumps in history, 1975, 1980, 2008. They're heading down fast. And you just look at Fed funds, they're still heading up, Fed funds rates. now. And the thing about 5.5% Fed funds, it's above every inflation metric in this country, particularly, let's look at PPI, producer price index, the low this year is minus 3.1%. Now we're ticking down negative. The high in 2008 was plus 9.9%. So if you look at 
that on a surface basis that shows severe deflationary forces. Just getting started, there's one key metric, I'm saying one key measure that's pushing back on that, and that's this resilient U.S. stock market. And it's U.S. stock market versus the rest of the world. So I think that is the major shoe that can drop for normal recession. And there's key things I like to point out that are in, clearly in recession already. Now, first of all, leading indicators, the year-over-year -year measures minus 7.8%. We've never been down minus 7.8% without a recession. That data goes back 100 years. My data since 1960 has been consistent with everyone who's recessions. Maybe it's wrong. Maybe we'll get lucky. Then you look at U.S. demand for diesel, unleaded gas, natural gas, and container boards, corrugated boxes, they're all already in recession, clearly heading down trajectory similar to the last recessions, 2008 and nine. And the key fact is, the, it was just a few months ago, most central banks were still hiking. So let's look over at the major block uh, economy in the world, that's Europe. Europe's technically in recession, GDP's negative, ECB just hiked rates, Bank of England just hiked rates back in July, basically Q3. And you look at PMIs, they're all negative. You look at retail sales, they're all negative. Certainly, if you measure versus inflation, if you look at um, GDP, they're very much lagging, but those are negative. Now, let's tilt over to China. The property crisis there by Bloomberg Intelligence measures is might be risk, properties risking at risk of default is maybe 12% of GDP. I heard um, from, I think it was ALF, ALF Piccatelli, I think is an ALF, everybody knows ALF, it's a great macro strategist, pointed out that the value of, of Chinese property last year, I think got up to 50 trillion, one of the greatest asset class on the planet. It reminds me very much of Japan at its peak, Soviet Union at its peak, and the things I heard described in Atlas Shrug. So what I see here is that slow, with the gradually then suddenly this recession, it should really kick in in 2014, so in 2024. I'll end with this. Key metrics I've been really watching and sticking with is gold's one of the best performing commodities this year. It's up almost 10%. Crude oil's one of the worst. Industrial metals are the worst. So it's all, all recession trajectories. The key question you have to ask yourself, Adrian, is what stops that? And typically it takes a decent lag to central bank easing or massive fiscal stimulus. Now you're getting the fixed fiscal stimulus in the US, but it's being offset by monetary restraint. So to me, these bodies in motion risk towards a normal recession next year and things like what I'm really concerned for cryptos, the altcoins we all know are just way too speculative excesses, excessive. Ethereum looks like it's putting a good peak around 2000. And I'm really worried that all this hopium for Bitcoin ETFs, yeah, it's very good. Bitcoin's a re revolutionary digital asset and we're going that way. But if I'm right about the tide just going out for normal equity bear market for recession, then um, Bitcoin should suffer. Okay, that makes a lot of sense, right? So is that an actual general overview or outlook uh, from from a Bloomberg's perspective? Is it, or are you the lone writer with this sort of like an opinion? So every one of my views are my own opinions in Bloomberg Intelligence. Um, Bloomberg Intelligence ETF guys said, we're pretty sure we're gonna get a, a slew of ETF um, tracking um, Bitcoin in January, maybe get the approvals in, and who knows exactly what's going to happen. The market's priced for that. I mean, we've jumped pretty much from 25 to 36 as we're doing this, taping this on Friday, November uh, 17th. Um, so Bloomberg doesn't have an official view on anything. This is a, I'm an independent strategist. So my view on Bitcoin is somewhat, I'm kind of backing off and staying away from it. And I'm really more focusing on gold, partly because it's the macro that matters. The macro is overwhelming. And the bottom line simple fact is we've had a 17% rally in the S&P 500 this year. Despite that, crude oil's down, industrial metals down, gold's up. That's a recessionary tilt. It means stock market's got to keep going up. But the key thing is Bitcoin and cryptos are up with the stock market. So that's not showing it's, it's divergent. Um, store of value properties and everything. The key thing I'm concerned about is the consensus I get from the crypto space is Bitcoin is the alternative. I get it, it is. Um, but the key thing to remember is compared to gold, the stock market, and most bond markets, Bitcoin is basically, the volatility is about three times that of gold and S&P 500. So if the stock market goes down for a normal recession, which I expect, and I've been early, I've been wrong, um, then it'll have a problem. To me, that's we haven't seen yet. We just haven't seen that divergent, that test. You need to see that good test of Bitcoin. Like I said, last year, everything went down. Bitcoin went down more. This year, everything is at up. Bitcoin's up more. That's what it does. Um, the thing is, we all know they also most toast. That, that speculative excess taken out by this rapidly 
rise in interest rates. And a key thing to remember is that I'd like to point out is that two-year note, a U.S. government two-year note, it's now below 5%, but it spent most of the Q3 in, in October above 5%. To me, that's the giant um, black hole for all risk assets. And even the black uh, is showing the wrecking ball status of the dollar. I mean, we have the yen, um, the rupee, the um, uh, and certainly yuan, uh, these countries, not so much the rupee, but they have to support their currencies because the rates in the U.S. are so high versus their, their base rates. And that's the dollar being the wrecking ball. And all that is really much of a pressure factor for things like um, Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I mean, you know, what if there was a study uh, that some time ago, myself and Jeff Hirsch, who's in, um, I, would, I would dare say, godfather of seasonal studies for for the stock market, along with his late father, Yale Hirsch, uh, we put together this Bitcoin seasonality article, right? We put we, we loaded it with numbers, with facts, and the seasonals uh, aligned very well with NASDAQ, for instance, right? Overall, there is like this strong positive trend where Bitcoin becomes more and more like the NASDAQ trading, more volatile version of a of a NASDAQ, right? Yep. And Having having this bull market that's taken as basically like you rightly mentioned, you know, seventeen percent on the S and P five hundred alone this year, year to date, uh, from the October low of the last year. So, isn't the actual bull market leading potentially the economy out of the recession? So, in the stock market, yes, Bitcoin, no. The key thing I like to point out is. Um, Bitcoin is still a, one of the most significant 24-7 trading lead indicators, bar none, leading indicators on the planet. Um, but the key thing I keep pointing out, and I know I get a lot of pushback from people who are seem to um, be completely biased to Bitcoin, is that um, the risks of it going mainstream means the correlations should continue to increase versus most risk assets like the NASDAQ. Volatility should continue to decline. These are basics. And that is if the NASA goes down for recession, Bitcoin's going to have a problem. So I always look at it. The bottom line here is the macro is overwhelming. You look at things like gold, it's just a few percentage points from its all time high. Bitcoin is how far? Maybe 50% from its all time high. Okay, a little less. Um, uh, that to me is I look at gold as the more enduring uh, bull market here. It's just ready to break out. And Bitcoin's already had it. And it's just going to be more subject to a normal recession. What's going to take, I think, for gold to break out is just a normal drop in the stock market for recession. So here's a key thing I think that's pressured for Bitcoin's a digital version of gold. Gold's old analog. And most young people don't care about it anymore. But I think there's going to be FOMO more in gold, um, partly because of people, I think, have forgotten how cheap it is versus the stock market. Historically, it's very low. And if we get this normal recession. So here, key things, leading indicators in this country are minus 7.8%. We've never had that without a recession. Um, and I think what's different is the amount of wealth that was created with this biggest pump in liquidity in history, bar none, is still making people feel wealthy. I mean, we increased money supply 40%. The thing is money supply is heading lower in the US and Europe now. We all know the lessons of, of risk asset <laughs> as you follow the money downward is a trajectory. So I think this year it might be just a big short covering rally in risk assets. Um, and the, um, the- This year, 2023, you mean, still? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're still heading, uh, money supply in this uh, year over year, minus two or 3%. M M money supply measure M3 in Europe is negative. We have all those measures on, on the terminal. But I'm worried that of the rules of simple reversion, Adrian. So why was everything up this year? Because everything was down a lot last year. Why is crude oil down this year? Because it was up again last year. Now that's a major elastic pendulum swinging market. That's crude oil. You never want to get longer when it goes up too much. And you always want to get longer when it goes down too much. And it always does. It just swings back. The key thing to remember here is we're walking to 2024 with the NASDAQ of 44%. What's the risk of that just dropping back 20% next year for a normal recession. Um, we walk in with the world's worst performing asset three years in a row is U.S. Treasury bonds. What's the risk of Treasury tiny notes popping up, which popped up to 5% last year, just dropping towards three next year? I think it's just normal, normal cycles. Um, why should the Fed ease? Nope, the Fed's not gonna ease with the ease they have for my entire lifetime because the liquidity and the inflation that was created for the past um, easing period. So to me, this is part of the great big reset that markets haven't figured out yet. 
Um, and that is we had such a distortion from this massive wealth spike that's going away. And um, we've had this massive jump in fiscal stimulus in this country, up to 8% of GDP this year. Now it's down to 6% now, but we've never had that pump um, debt to GDP, um, that much of excess uh, deficit spending without a recession or war. Now, okay, there's regional wars, but that to me is just how bad it is getting and just how the normal reversion tendencies, I think, will really start kicking in. Yes, I was early, admit that. Bitcoin was way too cheap at 15. We got that. But when it got up to 30 and so fast and I see this big macro tilt, that's why I'm concerned that the big the macro is overwhelming. And if I'm wrong, we don't get this normal correction in the stock market for a recession next year. That's awesome. But most people, rational investors who are, um, I think, scooping up U.S. Treasuries at an average rate of 5% and a two-year note that was around 5% and by in two years from now are going to guarantee 10%, I think are... Um, kind of just being prudent. Mm. So where's where's Bitcoin halving in all that? Well, it's already known. It's a known known. I mean, a known knowns never really matter in markets. I like how people work cycles around it, but you can't work cycle around a, something that's been around for 13 years. I mean, it's, it's existing. Now you can do that with gold. It's been around for thousands of years and futures have been around for quite a long time. Even crude oil futures only started trading in 1983. And now we can see pretty, but you can see when crude oil futures started, it really changed in the dynamics of how crude oil traded over time, at least when we have our measures going back 100 years. So I'd say it's an ins it's, it's a macro big picture thing. Macro big picture is the way I like to look at Bitcoin is dim diminishing um, supply, increasing demand and demotion, the demand and adoption price must go up over time. It's already going up the best performing asset in the planet. That's a problem. It already has been. The thing is now it's in the mainstream. Most of the people who made a lot of money trading Bitcoin, Bitcoin bought it when everybody else said they were idiots. Oh, it's di silly digital money. But now, when you people have Larry Fink saying it's the thing to do, you got to expect the best days are over. Now, sure, you probably can you can get up to 100 grand if everything else is okay. It might eventually get there. But now it's in the mainstream. And the lesson I've learned is when everybody says it's the right thing to do, it's probably <laughs> most of that trade's probably over. Now, in the stock market, yes, you get the masses going in. They have 401ks and things like that. And yes, there's a lot of hope for. Bitcoin ETFs, this is things we predicted five years ago. We launched a Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index. It was just fully expected at some point that's going to be tracked by an ETF. It's taken way too long. But the bottom line now is, remember, is it's it's in the mainstream in a big way, which means its best years are over. Um, and the bottom line to me still is the macro is overwhelming. The macro is the U.S. is our Bloomberg economics team, if you want to talk about Bloomberg views, fully expects a recession to start late this year, which is moving early next year. Now, they've been way too early, but there's been major reasons for that to be delayed. Leading in account and, and economic indicators expects that. And the thing is, cryptos have never seen a true um, recession, particularly not global. Now, it's already the case in Europe, China potentially, and the U.S. is the big whammy. Um, and it's just a question of time, I, I think. Hmm. So that, that actually, you know, answers so many of the questions. Uh, I'll have a couple of your tweets actually to go for later in the show, if you don't mind, right? Because you always put up, you know, such an Shoot. excellent content. And I'm a big fan. Full disclosure, I'm a big fan. I'm a, I'm a groupie of Mike's, you know, I'm a longtime follower and I just love what Mike does. So uh, take away with a grain of salt if I just uh, uh, praise too much. I, I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's far from truth because the Mike is, you know, Mike, is a purest form of, of, of intelligence and experience speaking through it. And uh, if we are to actually, you know, take and talk you know, about the halving, what's priced in, what's not priced in, what I've noticed, Mike, lately is that there are, there are a lot of people coming in, right? A lot of people coming in into the space, of course, encouraged by uh, by this, you know, local growth, local steady uptrend, you know, that Bitcoin has had over a year, you know, over, over a year, eventually since the, since the FTX collapsed. Uh, that is encouraging still what it looks like an early stage of the bull market and taking the seasonal study that I did with the Jeff Hirsch, uh, with, the, with, with Jeff Hirsch and his old backup of the historical data, uh, was that halving always kind of like endorses Bitcoin to move higher and stronger, right? And even though there is this diminishing return over the time, because it used to be 30, 30x, like 3,000%, oh, sorry, 9,000%. Then the second halving was 3,000%. The third halving of May 2020 took us from the halving to the subsequent peak 700% higher, right? Towards 69, 60, um, $70,000 even on some exchanges. So there is this 
tendency, even though the, the span is short, uh, is short, the time data history is short, there's some repetitive pattern, right? So isn't that actually um, knowing that Bitcoin is a leading indicator, just like you said, Riley, isn't that impacting the economy in a way? Well, um, I think it's what a half a half a uh, billion dollar asset and half a trillion dollar asset um, stock market in the U.S. is what fifty trillion? <laughs> Almost, I, I haven't checked it lately. Um, and total stock market market caps around a hundred, and maybe a little more or less. Um, as a leading indicator, bar none, twenty four seven. There's nothing comparable. Um, but the key thing is we have to remember these are all widely known, known knowns, and basically you're at, it's just everybody knows it now. That's the problem with I just the lesson you learn in markets is first of all, I do love that mantra that if it's gonna if it goes up, it's gonna go up. Now that's been the case in the equity market since 2011 in a very unique time of very low interest rates, a very common in the Fed. And it's also been the case historically. The Fed Bottom line, going back to macro a little bit, is every single time the U.S. equity market, stock market, S&P 500 was down 20% on an annual 12-month basis, the Fed was always easing. Going back to like 1950s, one example where they weren't was 1988 because it was after the crash. It already had that fluctuation. That's what's changed. The world is, remember, this has changed. There's markets price for easing. It's expecting the Fed to maybe drop another 100 basis points in a year. Um, but they've got to be forced to do that, I think. Now, people are saying it's going to be because of plunging inflation. That'll be great. But I see no incentive for them to do it because of the risks of what happened the last time they did. So put Bitcoin in there. Yes, Bitcoin has been great. But the bottom line is it's mainstream now. you, you got to be very circumspect using past performance in this case because it was a baby. It was, you know, it was when it was if you bought Bitcoin, people thought you were nuts. And, of course, it went it up and then they it was just the, it was a great thing. But remember, the price right now on 36 was traded, what, two years ago? Um, and 36,000, I mean, that's appreciated from when it, when did it first trade 100? Was that 2011, I think? So that's pretty wow. a lot. I mean, so my point is, it's already been the best performing asset in history. And it's widely known. But the key thing I'm worried about now is um, the FOMO factor in a world that's changed. And that is the liquidity that drives all markets is not there right now. In some cases, yeah. Yes, people use examples. I just use the basic example of the Fed and central banks are not easy and will never ease with the ease they have in the past until markets make them. Bitcoin is a good leading indicator in that space. You could argue that its rally that really popped it from 25 to 36 now was a good indicator for the stock market started breaking down and broke S&P 500 broke behold its 200-day moving average and popped right back up again. You can argue that Bitcoin was a leading indicator for that. The bottom line is for this year, if you look at all risk assets, cryptos, Bitcoin are up. And stock market is up a lot. What's the risk for next year if we go for the normal recession? We have to ask the question. I think the risk is normal reversion in all risk assets. It would be to, what I'm looking forward to see to be over to to for bitcoins to show divergent strength in the macro versus weakness in equities. And right now it's not. It's just um, a higher beta asset with promise of being digital gold and world going that way. Yeah, that's great. I get that fully endorse it and fully agree with it, but that's why I like to compare it to gold. Right now I look at gold. That's why I look at assets that people are not talking about so much. Only the gold bugs really care about that are kind of pushed by the wayside. And as a regular investor, you think, okay, that might have the one have the opportunity. So that's why as I'm looking at next year, I think gold's going to continue what it's going to do in this year. It'll probably outperform um, go, most other crypto assets, I'm sorry, not crypto assets, mo, uh, most other commodities. Um, and I'm looking at that one breaking out new highs, particularly if the stock market drops. And if I'm right about the stock market dropping, we need to show Bitcoin, both Bitcoin needs to show divergent strength to that. And typically it's, as you mentioned earlier with the NASDAQ, it's positively correlated and positively correlated liquidity. So what's going to take for liquidity? Typically lower risk assets. Um, and this, remember, Bitcoin's one of the riskiest, uh, cryptos are one of the, among the riskiest of assets with the promise, of course, is which is why we're here. That's true. That's true. So if you don't mind kind of like, you know, just uh, if we take a look at a couple of your, of your tweets to go to run through the charts, sure. uh, this is such an excellent, uh, such an excellent, um, well, chart that, that, you, that you popped yeah. up in here. Um, pain and pain, pain versus gain pendulum could favor gold and long bonds in 2024. The elusive U.S. recession may gain fuel 
from an additional 100 dps of rate hikes right so what's next for the rate hikes what is what is the thing that you're sensing regarding the rate hikes for the next several months so what i show you on the bottom of that chart i'm glad you feature it that's the federal funds futures i used to trade these I used to be in that pit in chicago and uh, federal fund futures expectations it basically shows where the market expects the fed fund futures to be in one year when you see a bottom in that it's price it's the inverse of the um, rate you see a bottom that it's usually an indication the market's starting to expect the fed's going to start easing it's still stuck there yeah okay it's still stuck around five percent see that bottom in 2018 that's when gold um, bottom around twelve hundred dollars an ounce and everything took off um what's unique and significant about this is etf holdings of gold um this year have been severely negative compared to the price it's never this extreme they're down about seven percent with the gold price up about ten percent on a year-over-year -year basis to november 17th and that's what i think is just starting to bottom that's what you can see in that chart is etf holdings of gold so who've been buying gold this year the biggest the deepest pockets in the planet central banks now safe adina anamis in his book um bitcoin standards predict um banks will buy um central banks will buy bitcoin someday i do not disagree with him i agree that will happen but right now as a strategist, I looked at, look at, there's a good bull market. See, gold is bumping up against those highs. It's good reason for it to go back up. And it's one key catalyst for it to, to break out to new highs. And I think that is the um, pivot from the Fed, which might not come until we see a drop in the stock market for a U.S. recession. So that's where I point out the risk of Bitcoin. So what I'm expecting for this year to point out, pain versus gain is so important. Where was all the gain this year? all risk assets so where's the pain potential next year so one thing i want to point out is i think gbtc it's one of the best performing assets this year grayscale bitcoin trust it's up almost 250 percent why is it up because of the pain it went through last year it got down to a discount of around 50 percent the price dropped around eight and right now the Price is twenty-eight dollars and fifty-seven cents. Why? Because it was beat up and it's going up. To me, that's what you have to expect next year. Is um, the opposite of that. The gain this year might revert to pain this year. So, what was the most beat up asset in the last three years? U.S. long bonds. TLT. The the um, is a major long bond ETF. It was just getting hammered. I'm looking for T TLT uh, bond prices, bond yields to bond yields to drop and prices to go up with gold next year for normal recession. That's where I'm kind of worried about Bitcoin. And that's why I've been saying for people is, if you look at that US government, you know, 5%, and you know you can guarantee 10% return guaranteed in two years for that, that's the highest you've been able to get in almost 20 years. To me, that's what prudent investors are doing. And I think the pain versus gain trade for next year, watch out. So here's the key thing is, is the NASDAQ going to drop jump another 45% next year? It might just come back 20%. That's a normal reversion. What does that mean for everything else? That to me is what I'm looking at for next year. And I think most investors are starting to get it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I mean, I perfectly agree you know, that after every severe uptime, there has to be, well, not re markets have no rules. However, what, what happens is that the market reverses to the mean, right? Which makes so, a lot so of sense. So markets do have rules. That, they, they do have one rule, I, I, not to interrupt you, and that is sometimes um, for traders, has to be as painful as possible and if it's easy something's wrong and that's what i'm really concerned about bitcoin it just seems so easy oh there's going to be an etf you got to buy it that easy yeah i mean that that's a you know there's a little there's room for for a very interesting discussion to be had and i think you know we would if we get into and they'll delve into that too <laughs> we wouldn't run we would run out of time for that still there are some other very good points that you mentioned that i wanted to touch upon right so, so here's what i want them, here's one i follow just you you go you go ahead please no, no, no. Go well, ahead, just, Mike. You're the VIP just, just, guest. Well, no, well, just the one key thing I want to point out is I got wrong crude oil. I was way too early in my bearishness. But it finally tilted out tilted that way. The low this year is 65, 64 dollars and six about sixty-four dollars. This time last year, most people were looking for it to go above one hundred. And why did that happen? Because the consensus was so bullish. And it was wrong. It just missed one major thing, the macro. And now it's all tilting back downwards. That is what I'm fearful is going to happen at risk assets next year. Is that consensus um, that you see following price, which is so simplistic, sometimes it has to remember that there's kind of sometimes um, the pendulum gets too high or too low and just swings back. Mm. That makes sense. Again, so the mean reversion, right? Mean reversion is present. It, it happens everywhere we go because that's the nature of the statistics anyway right we kind of like continue to oh, yeah, offer and, ourselves and, yeah. yeah exactly and it's the definition of the mean is it days weeks months years <laughs> that's the key part the key tricky part is defining that mean 
Yeah, yeah. I mean that you know the the whole I think beauty of of the markets of well myself as a charter market technician, you know, is that all those trends, all those price action, all those movements, you know, what's happening in the finance and the macro finances, uh, they are fractals to an extent, right? So there are some, you know, while watching the price charts, there are some uh, premises in a way that whatever we tend to observe in terms of the price action, the trends, the movements, patterns, whatever you name it, uh, at lower time frames, they're going to somehow just appear in a similar fashion on the different time frames, right? So having this fractal effect still, you know, uh, helps us kind of like lean, zoom out a little bit and search for those long-term trends on the, for, let's say, the weekly chart that even the monthly or so. Speaking of which, right, if there is, knowing that Bitcoin is not really backed by any central centralized entity, right? The, the, the information, the feedback that I often get when I talk, you know, to the hedge funds, to institutions about Bitcoin, why would they not get interest in getting any sort of like Bitcoin? Uh, is that, first of all, it doesn't fit into traditional stock market model. Second of all, that it's not backed by any central kind of like centralized entity, which kind of like gives them a little bit of a hesitation and, and, and this distrust, this disbelief, uh, since you know, apparently decentralization is a, is a, is a synonym of, of security in a way, which I, to an extent, understand and appreciate. Still, what I would say is that Bitcoin is very, in its nature, economic driven. It's a very supply and demand driven asset in a way, right? And there is a lot of those behavioral psychology, behavioral finance, if you will, phenomena that happen that often drive the prices ridiculously high and ridiculously low in the various phases. So don't you think in a way that having all that mean reversion fashion in the finance, uh, isn't the actual trend strong enough to just basically slide through the slide through this correction, corrective period and just continue to rally for the whole 2024? Um, if it's that easy, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so what? So um, here's one I want to describe it as a ex hedge fund person, having sat in front value at risk models. Is I look at the consensus of so what's Bitcoin? Um, what's it, its performance? It basically trades with volatility that's about three times um, the S P 500 in gold. And when it gets to be 500 Nasdaq's up, it goes up typically three times that, 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 and when it goes down, it goes down just as much, sometimes more. Has that changed? I need to see that. That to me is one thing to remember about al asset allocators adding to Bitcoin. Anybody who stayed long or overweighted long the Nasdaq there this year is crushing it. If you were long Bitcoin and you were wrong and it, it was a new asset in your portfolio, you got have an extra ri risk because it's so nascent and it's, you have less excuse to lose money in that space. Um, so that's the bottom line to remember, is this asset, unlike gold, which typically trades with, trades with a lower volatility, it's a risk off assets. And unlike treasuries and certainly treasury bonds, which have been volatile lately, but typically do well in risk off environments or in recessionary environments or deflationary environments, that's the key thing to remember on Bitcoin from a rational management, money management standpoint, traditional CFA type stuff, which I, gotten forgotten many decades ago is don't underestimate the uh, value at risk model here it's again the bottom line is it still trades at many x's the volatility of most um the benchmark for for the benchmark measure for risk assets and the plan is the s p 500 and bitcoin's basically three times the risk of it now the thing is in the past it was almost 10 times that risk that's when we're measuring bitcoin from all these halvings and things 10 years ago that the what world's changed you see the volatility is going down but it's still many times that and that's what i'm worried for the macro has been overwhelming the last two years the macro i think will next year will be the most overwhelming in our lifetimes and that's the great reset if i'm right on that everything's tilting that way for the great reset um, then all risk assets will have a problem and most risk off assets will do better in a deflationary environment. The key thing I like to point out, Adrian, is we are clearly in a significant deflationary environment. Let's just look at the U.S. measure for number one measure for heat, electrician, fertilizers in, in this country, natural gas. It dropped from 10 to 2 this year. 2 was first traded in 1990. Yes, it's a commodity, but why is that so deflationary? It's because that's the way humans are we create more with less every day 
Um, so that's why I like thing is, but key thing to remember about Bitcoin is what you mentioned is I think the key thing that's attractive about it, it is no one's project or no one's liability. It's completely independent. And having been a person who used to work and trade in the futures trading pits in Chicago that would get shut down some, and sometimes from acts of God and and people, I had customers suing exchanges because their options expired because the, the exchange had to shut down for um other issues that's the unique thing about bitcoin it never stops trading it's no one controlling it and that's an attractive but the thing is on a value at risk model it's a risky asset versus most other assets that might be going down for recession mm. that makes a lot of sense right so speaking as well of of um calling a little bit to back to gold right because one of the excellent tweets of yours that's um that really caught my attention was the three thousand uh, dollar gold for target oh, yeah. for gold right and we're yeah. we're basically looking at again uh, this very awesome awesome write up. What would you would you like to run us run us through it, please? Yeah, well, I love the crocodile jaw crocodile jaw patterns, and that's what you see here. First, we have the S and P five hundred. If you divide it by GDP, U.S. GDP in trillion, so right now about twenty seven trillion, just multiply GDP by hundred, you have the S and P essentially S and P five hundred index essentially since 1928, and it just fluctuates around that level. It's a simplistic view of the Warren Buffett model that shows total value of stock market capitalization versus GDP. So what I show you here in white is if you take the S&P 500 divided by GDP, the recent peak we saw at the end of 21, beginning of 22, was the highest since 1936 or so, and well above the peak from 2000. So simple mean reversion risks in the S&P 500 in a normal recession to get back towards GDP are quite high. Yes, it's pumped because of tech, and yes, it's different. It always has. But overlaid with the other chart and the other one in gold, if you take the price of gold divided by the S&P 500, it's less than half the price. And that's the per ounce price of gold and the history of that is every single time the per ounce price of gold is below the five s p 500 and we have a recession it takes off now the most recent unique and best example was the year 2000 gold bottom around just above just below 300 bucks an ounce it was a significant discount to the s p 500 we had a recession and gold didn't peak till around essentially 1900 in 2011 to 13. So that's the situation we're in right now. Gold right now at um, 1980 an ounce, the S&P 500 is 4,500. It's less than half. If we get a normal recession, all you do is get a reversion. But in the big picture, remember, the gold does not pay, pay dividend and it does not have earnings. S&P 500 does. In the long term, it should always outperform gold in the big picture in terms of total return. But Bumps in the road can be very significant, particularly in a recession, for a good reason, and that is what pumped up the S&P 500 and really boosted gold a little bit was this pump in liquidity. And it's the lessons of the book uh, Boom and Bust is um, when you have biggest big pumps in liquidity and assets prices rally on those and you dump, they just dump hard. So that's, to me, it's a key thing to remember about that chart is gold is very cheap relatively, and S&P 500 is very expensive relatively to things like GDP historically. And so if we need to avoid a recession for that not to revert, is the way I see it. And leading indicators have been accurate for about 100 years from these levels. Mm -hmm. I see it. So still, you know, we, we are having a little bit of a, um, of a pitfall, you know, downfall, recessive, contractive, um, outlook for for the next several months due to the mean reverting nature of, of of the finance in a way again i've been wrong so many times myself you know lost thousands and hundreds of thousands if the millions of dollars in actual losses and in the uh, missed opportunities right the crypto so asymmetrically actually puts rent right in front of us and what is the one leading well or any other sort of indicator that would tell you mike that we are not heading for the recession anymore oh well the best leading indicator is typically the stock market um not heading towards a recession i would say uh, david rosenberg rosie Austin says if he had only one leading in indicator he was on a desert island he'd say the u.s yield curve that's still inverted so that's still pointing towards recession to not head towards recession that's a good question adrian but i appreciate the way you started out is sometimes it's most important to focus on what you got wrong and why 
And what I've got wrong this year and early on was I did not think the Fed would hike rates above 4%. I thought we'd be in recession by now. But the thing that's different is they hiked rates another 100 basis points this year. We've added so much fiscal stimulus. And so I think it's actually making it worse. And you can see that tilt in things like I mentioned in uh, crude oil, industrial metals, demand for all these products, container board, um, things like that. But to, to see if the indicators show we're not in recession, probably be things like, um, I have to look at leading indicators. So stock market's number one. Lagging are things like retail sales. The thing I've watched from retail sales lately is if you look at retail sales, divide by CPI in a year over year basis, it's almost as bad, it, it, they're negative. Um, if you look at, um, so what else could be, I think that's the key thing, it's usually the stock market. Um, but the key thing I'm worried about is it's somewhat near the end, uh, it hasn't figured out, that those things that really force the stock market higher for a decade, and that's mostly the U.S. I mean, the U.S. outperforming the world now in the stock market has been uh, unprecedented. Um, and the thing is, reversion in that is why it's significant. So I think things like retail sales are, are stuff, but the stock market is usually the best leading indicator, and it's still strong, and I have to admit that. That's why, but um, I think it's somewhat a delusional stage right now because I look at... Um, um, that's how human nature is. I think it's a little bit too much hopium versus reality. And that is you just look around me in Miami, there's been so much wealth created because this pump, not just Miami, the world, because it's pumping liquidity. People feel well, wealthy until they don't. I think you're on mute. You're on mute. Yeah, I'm so there sorry. I was saying I was saying that that was that was one of the strongest lines to actually slowly start wrapping up our session. Mike, having having just a couple of more minutes left, um, you know, I'm, I'm searching for this one, um, for this one, let's say target. I mean, what I what I'm talking about myself, I think you know, if I were a beginner, that there are so many of of, of the beginners coming in, you know, from the crypto um, side and and beyond. Do you have any particular target? Would an all-time high in the S&P 500 or NASDAQ, for instance, convince you that we are not in the recession anymore? Oh, actually, I'm afraid of it being the um, the opposite. Um, so let's remember, I'm, I'm, I'm been expecting, once you saw that it wasn't going down, I'm saying, okay, what hurts the most people here? Make a new high, too high an all-time too high, new high, and get everybody fomoed in and bullish. That's what I've heard lately. People are, we're getting towards the end of the year, and anybody who's underperforming has to show that they're involved. Um, and, and a tracking. That's part of the reason the Nasdaq's up 44% this <laughs> year. Um, so I'm afraid of the opposite. Um, that could be a good indicator. It might work. I'm a f still fearful of the, of the cycle that's almost inevitable that if that happens, what does it mean for the Fed? Will they cut rates to make that happen? No, because that's part of what created inflation in the first place. Will it make them more resilient to keep rates up? Yes, that's what I'm worried about is the lose-lose there if that happens. But I'm still afraid it could, ha it could, and it could make it worse when things go down. So let's look at one simple example in history of mean reversion, the 1987 stock market crash. At that time, stock market was very cheap if you look at the S&P model versus GDP. And it was just one day. The year ended up 2% the s p 500 and you look back on it and if you didn't know there was a crash you'd say yeah, it was nothing it just got too expensive but it also shook things up the difference now is we are so expensive versus gdp stuff that used to matter and that one that one shows it the uh chart in white is stock market versus gdp uh no actually which one is that one that's us stocks oh uh, yeah that's right um it's just versus commodities so i'm more worried that um this cycle will be normal, and the more we delay it, the worse it's going to be. And this year has been a good delay. If we could have just got it over with, that would have been wonderful. But now that we've bounced up so much, and we've hiked rates so much, and inflation's just actually, in some measures, collapsing harder, um, that, like I mentioned, PPI is negative, producer price is negative. That's kind of the one that's the uh, high beta inflation measure. Mm -hmm. So, so the race of the inflation coming down, right? CPI, PPI. Do you think that poses any actual risk, like a major risk, major threat to the market? No, I think um, exogenous uh, risk we can't predict. I remember one thing about the last big recession when the stock market was way expensive in two thousand was we had the um, the um, uh, 9 11 attacks. Now that kind of accelerated an existing thing. So that I can't predict. I hope that doesn't happen. 
but um, what I, I mean, what you're showing there is um, commodities are already deflating. And I like to compare, if you just take the Bloomberg Commodity Index relative to that GDP, World Bank measure of global GDP, you can see that downward trajectory in white. It just looks like it's just tipped up and rolling over. And see those little um, magenta lines? That's when you get a recession. And right before you get recessions, oftentimes commodities spike. Well, we got that. We're supposed to get a recession next year. It's all there. But if you lock over that orange chart, you look at that's how expensive the U.S. stock market is versus global GDP. So I'm afraid that all this is just going to tilt lower. But what's normally that normal that happens that's really different this time, Adrian, is typically for commodities to bottom and the stock market to bottom, it takes a lag to Federal Reserve easing. Now, people keep pointing out the one example of the rate hike cycle 1994. I remember that well, but stocks are cheap. <laughs> in 94. They weren't expensive as they are now. And they weren't in the back of this biggest li liquidity pump. So what I'm afraid of what's really different now is um, we just a few months ago had most central banks on the planet still hiking rates. And the early effects of the, those are early days. So look at existing home sales in this country. They're collapsing. You look at things like Home Depot and Lowe's, those prices are much lower. And that whole market's completely seized up. It looks like what's going to save that? So I like enjoy when people in the real estate market say, no, when rates drop. I'm like, well, rates probably won't drop until asset prices drop first. If you look at the lessons of things like this in history. Um, and again, I look at it from a Fed standpoint, their core measures of PCE, personal consumption expenditures and employment cost indices are 4%. And our Bloomberg economics expects them to be sticky around 4% and their targets too. So there's no hurry unless you get a good catalyst to go down and the key, I mean, to drop rates, the key catalyst to drop rates historically is the stock market going down. Mm. That is, well, Again, a lot of wisdom, a lot of experience picking through uh, from Mike's sense over here, everybody, because having spent about 40, 45, 50 minutes almost with, with Mike, I already appreciate the amount of knowledge and the expertise that Mike has shared. So I'm reason, uh, the reason, one of the reasons I'm displaying uh, the screen right now with Mike's uh, Twitter ex, ex post is the high encouragement and very, very warm encouragement to uh, make sure that you have Mike on your following list. So if you if you do not have it, uh, please make sure you actually fix that uh, and uh, find Mike at Mike McLone eleven. Mike McLone eleven, because uh, as you can clearly see, there is a lot of experience. And I mean, as the crypto folks, we the crypto folks, we need reliable education. We need reliable information that is so hard to find, right? And here we are talking to senior, senior senior commodity strategist of Bloomberg Intelligence, Mike McGlone, spreading so much alpha. Mike, if there is one final closing tip remark uh, for 2024 as we approach it inevitably, what's that going to be? Um, I'll repeat what I've um, been pointed out, that the U.S. Treasury curve is a little bit below 5% now. It's peaked around 5%. I think the ability to get the highest, safest asset around 5% annual return. Now that's, if you'll get to, you know, that's give you 10% in two years. Um, the high, in 20 years is overwhelming. It's an overwhelming black hole for risk assets and something most, most crypto people have never seen. And remember, cryptos are highly speculative digital assets. I think that's gonna pan out next year. Those rates are going to drop. I think it's more likely that the rates drop because risk assets fall for normal U.S. recession. Now, if that doesn't happen, that's wonderful, but you still make about 10% U.S. government two notes over a two-year period. Mm -hmm. So expect the unexpected, mean reversion, and beyond that, Mike McGlone of uh, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Commodity Strategist with plenty of experience has been our guest today. Thank you so much, Mike, for sharing all this wisdom uh, with us. That's been a pleasure having this meeting with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adrian. It's a pleasure being with you. And I do think you have the better hair. <laughs> oh, man, that, that is arguable. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mike McGlynn, thank you so much again. Uh, and that's a wrap for Free Trading Congress, uh, the day three of our sessions. Let's uh, keep in touch on Twitter and to follow Mike. Thank you again.